The country lies in the sub-region of the Pacific Ocean known as Micronesia, which is obviously where the country gets its name from, which also includes the states of Palau, Nauru, parts of Kiribati, and the U.S. territories of Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands and Wake Island. The country is made up of 607 islands, sometimes collectively referred to as the Caroline Islands. These take up over a million square miles of oceanic territory in their exclusive economic zone. However, in land surface area, they only make up about 217 square miles. All the islands are divided into four states made up of island clusters. They are Yap, Chuk, Pompeii, not Pompeii, Pompeii. Oh, and don't forget this little straggler, Kapingamarangi, belongs to it. And finally, little Kosre. The traditional currency on Yap is giant stone rings known as rye stones. The rye stones that constituted money were of various sizes, rising to large circular discs with a hole in the middle that weigh up to four metric tons. Each Yap village had dozens of rye stones scattered around town. As you can imagine, people can't carry these stones around the island to pay with them. Instead, the Yapis collectively remembered who owns each stone and kept a mental log of past transactions. For instance, if the chieftain's son wanted to buy a house from the carpenter, he might announce to the village that one rye stone he controls, say the one in the middle of the town, now belongs to the carpenter. The villagers would spread the word that the chieftain's son gave a stone to a carpenter. Then if the carpenter wants to give that stone to someone else, the villagers will let him, since everyone's mental records say that the stone now belongs to him. Roughly speaking, someone can spend a stone if most villagers agree that they own it. There was effectively no way of stealing the stone because its ownership was known to everyone. The impressive part of the rye stone system is that all kinds of economic activity can happen without stones physically moving at all. You can own a stone even if it is on the other side of the town from your house. In fact, you can even use rye stones even if they can never be seen again. Hundreds of years ago, a ship carrying a rye stone sank off the coast. The local villagers reasoned that stone must still exist somewhere on the ocean floor. So people kept paying each other with the stone as if nothing happened. In other words, in the rye stone system, the physical location and movement of the stones doesn't matter at all. This stands in stark contrast to traditional tangible money systems, where the physical location and movement of money does matter. The only money you own is the money in your house or on your person. And the only way you can pay someone is by handing over physical items to them. This means that the rye stone system System is a form of intangible money. It's quite like money in a bank, which we know to be intangible. It doesn't matter where the dollar bills are or even if they exist at all. And when you send someone money, no physical money moves. Moreover, the rye stone system is democratic. You own a stone if a majority of your fellow villagers agree that you do. Instead of trusting a single person or institution to track how much money you have, as you would in middlemen moderated money, you diffuse your trust across the whole village. This democratic system of deciding who owns stones, in other words, consensus, has a lot of advantages over a middlemen moderated system. Imagine an alternative universe where the village chieftain keeps the official log of payments and stone ownership, instead of the villagers collectively keeping a log via consensus. In this system, the Yapi's money system would behave a lot like a middleman moderated system. The chieftain would fill the role of a bank. The chieftain could easily force everyone to pay him a fee to make a payment, steal stones by strategically erasing payments from his logbook, lose his logbook and thus make the local economy grind to a halt and so on. The rye stone system is thus both intangible and middleman free. You get the convenience of a middleman moderated money, so that means no need to carry your money around, without the problems of relying on a middleman. It provides an example of that best of both worlds money system we talked about in the previous section. The lesson here is that the intangible money system always requires trust. You only relinquish physical control of your money if you can trust that something 
something or someone will keep an accurate record of your money. Yap's innovation was realizing that you can place your trust in systems, not middlemen. In this case, the trustworthy system was the mental log of transactions that the Yapis, villagers all shared by placing your trust in a shared consensus driven system. A group of people who follow shared rules, instead of a single person or entity, you get intangible money without the middlemen. We don't know if Satoshi Nakamoto studied Yap while developing Bitcoin, but his insight was very similar. Bitcoin is a digital currency, so it's intangible and it is middleman free because it doesn't rely on a bank or other institution to keep track of people's money balances. Instead, Bitcoin relies on a network of computers around the world to keep a shared log of ledger of every past payment. This shared public ledger, as it's known, is called a blockchain. And it's basically a high-tech version of Yapi's villagers' shared memory of past payments. In short, Bitcoin is a modern internet-friendly version of rice stones. It is both intangible and middleman-free, which makes it a compelling alternative to our traditional money system, which forces you to have either tangibility or middlemen.